Good afternoon. So Saul said no one would show up today. So you see, you're, you're wrong. You just don't know them. You don't know the pull of virology. What's that? Yeah, the, us the usual number, right? It's good. All right, everything we have talked about in this class so far is the product of evolution. The different kinds of structures, the replication schemes, pathogenesis, interaction with the host, all of it's been selected by these forces that we're going to try and summarize today. So what I would like to do is talk about where viruses came from, where we think they came from, where are they going, how are they going to get there, and how do we know? Four general questions. So by, by studying viruses, we have a great window on evolution and how it works because populations interact with viruses, they adapt to resist virus infections and in turn the viruses are selected that overcome whatever resistance mechanisms emerge. So there are selections on both ways and as I said before, viruses are always a step ahead of us, they're, they're still here. No matter what our immune systems do or any other defense systems, they're always evolving to escape it. On the other hand, if a host population, whether it be humans or voles or rabbits, if they don't adapt to resist the infections, at least to some degree, they won't, they won't be here anymore. They'll be wiped out. So there's always an interplay. It's a constant dynamic. Virus evolution is on clear view to the public every day, even to those who don't believe in evolution. It's, it's almost impossible not to believe it when you see what viruses are doing. But many people, of course, feel that viruses are not living and therefore not, they're not subject to the same rules. So the emergence of new viral diseases that we've talked about in this course, AIDS, West Nile virus, hepatitis C, uh, Marburg and Ebola, every time a new virus emerges, it's evolution at work. Uh, flu every year is evolution. The fact that we have to get a new flu vaccine every year is a consequence of virus evolution. Drug resistant HIV, as we talked about last time. Again, selection of resistant mutants. It's evolution. And the fact is that viruses evolve faster than any other thing on the planet for reasons that we'll talk about today. And many people don't understand this and therefore they don't view it as evolution. They see uh, a cow is part of evolution, but not a virus, and they're very different. So evolution, we're going to define it as the constant change of a viral population under selection pressure. And we'll talk about the kinds of pressures, some of the different kinds of pressures, but they're, they are uh, almost infinite. You can't imagine all of them. And as I said before, if the po host populations don't adapt, they disappear. Uh, and the viruses adapt very well because of their enormous diversity, huge numbers of progeny and diversity as we will see. So here are the two sources of viral diversity that allow them to evolve continuously and escape whatever the host does, mutation and recombination. We'll talk about how these work today. One thing that's really important for you to grasp at the outset is that we we look at virus evolution in terms of the whole population, not individual virus particles, not individual virus species. Uh, because a virus stock or a virus that it's infecting you or some other host is a population, incredibly diverse population as you will see. And as I said many times, that's made in huge amounts. So don't think of an individual virus particle as the average for a population. There's really no such thing. Um, this is only a recently appreciated aspect of virology, maybe in the past 30 or 40 years or so. And the consequence is that when you study virology, you're studying a population, you're a population biologist as a consequence. Now there was a famous um, biologist by the name of Stephen Jay Gould, and he paraphrased uh, Marshall McLuhan, who uh, said once, the medium is the message referring to television, and he says when it comes to viral evolution, the median is not the message. In other words, the average of the population is not what is so important. So we're going to see we, every virus population is this very large mixture of variants, 
and it's not the average that is important. It's individual members that may end up surviving after uh, a selection event. So in, in a population of thousands and thousands of genotypes of viruses, the average isn't important. One virus may end up surviving a selection event, whether it be airborne transmission or escaping antibody or something else, and that, that can make the population uh, survive. So the four main drivers of virus evolution are here, making a lot of progeny, as you've already g uh, garnered from this course, also making a lot of mutants at the same time, quasi-species effects. We'll talk about uh, what that is. We, we can't really talk about viruses as species because they are too heterogeneous, much more than we are. And so we call them quasi-species. And then uh, selection, which is applied to all of these uh, variabilities. So here's an example of the large numbers of progeny that are produced in infections and in which are one of the main drivers of evolution. And we have seen one of these before, human immunodeficiency virus. Uh, this is the, the half-life of the virus for HIV and hepatitis B. The daily turnover, 90% of HIV turns over every day. That means it loses infectivity and, and goes away and you have new viruses produced. Total production in the blood, uh, over 10 to the 11th for Hep B and 10 to the 9th for HIV. And then the half-life in the infected cell as well. So these are two examples of viruses that produce huge numbers of progeny every day in the infected individual. And that's one of the uh, reasons why variation in evolution occurs. So replicating viruses make a lot of mutant genomes I've mentioned before. We're going to talk about the mechanisms a bit more today. You have to have mutants to, to evolve. Every living thing that evolves, and they all do, evolve because they make mutations. Humans have evolved for many years because mutations in our genomes uh, have been selected for. But humans and other animals take a long time to evolve. It takes a long time for selection to bring out a phenotype in, in a human population, for example. Uh, viruses can do it in a half hour or an hour, depending on the replication cycle. This, this is a real difference between thousands of years and 20 minutes. So every time a nucleic acid is copied, mutations are produced, whether you're copying it in your cells or viruses are copying it, and that's the source of the mutation. RNA viruses, of course, make more mutations than any other virus, and these are probably the most successful uh, RNA viruses in terms of number of hosts colonized and different types of infections. And that's because, of course, their polymerase can't correct errors. DNA polymerases can, and RNA virus polymerases cannot. For RNA viruses, the average error frequency is one in 10,000 to 100,000 mistakes. So one mistake per 10,000 or 100,000 bases polymerized. So if you have a 10 kilobase virus genome, and the frequency is one in 10 to the four, every time the genome is replicated, uh, you get one mutation, uh, and then every 10,000 times the entire genome has been substituted. DNA viruses have a very different uh, lifestyle. They typically have a narrower host range. They often make persistent infections. Uh, and their genome replication is not as error prone. And there's a, probably a connection between these, these two properties. DNA viruses, as you know, are able to proofread the errors that they make. I think last time we, we had an image of that. And as a consequence, they have a lower mutation rate than RNA viruses. They exhibit less diversity, and they evolve more slowly than RNA viruses. So all other things ignored, this one property is important for the difference in uh, evol evolution between RNA and DNA viruses. So let's talk now about this quasi-species idea, which, as I said, is a relatively new concept for virology, last 30 years or so. And this was first described in a paper published in 1978. It was called Analysis of an RNA Bacteriophage Population. And what they did in this uh, paper, they looked at the sequence of a population of RNA bacteriophages by a technique 
that allowed them to sample the sequence. They weren't able to do nucleotide sequencing yet on the genome scale, but they were able to get a, a picture of the sequence, and they found enormous variation in single stocks of RNA viruses. So what they concluded was that a Q-beta phage population is a dynam in a dynamic equilibrium with viral mutants arising at a high rate on the one hand and being strongly selected against on the other. The genome cannot be described as a defined unique structure, but rather as a weighted average of a large number of different individual sequences. So this was really revolutionary because up until this time people are thinking, you know, you're standing there, you have a genome sequence and this virus has a genome sequence associated with it. And in fact, this, this collection of viruses that are infected my, resp my respiratory tract all have one sequence. But this showed that that's not the case. There's huge population variation. So that's what they called the quasi-species concept. You can't look at a virus stock as a species because almost every particle in the stock has a different nucleotide sequence as a consequence of the variation that we've just talked about. So we say that the populations exist as dynamic distributions of non-identical but related replicons, all right? So that means they're very different, but they're all still influenza virus or rabies virus. You can tell by looking at the sequence, but every member is different, and that's what we call a quasi-species. So this, is, this holds for every RNA virus, and even though DNA viruses mutate less uh, less frequently than RNA viruses, we, they probably have their own kind of quasi-species as well. So here's an illustration of what a quasi-species looks like. These are, each line in this diagram is a viral RNA genome, and the different symbols represent different mutations. So these are far fewer mutations than you'd probably expect to find in each genome, but it's just for illustration. And you can see that every genome is different. And this is probably true for most RNA virus stocks. The sequence of every genome is different in some way. If you take the average of this sequence, this is what you get on the bottom. It's just a straight line. There's nothing, nothing special because it's an average of all of these differences. Uh, and there is, are probably few, if any, genomes that look like this. There happens to be one drawn in here. But if there are, they're very rare that there is a genome representing the average. Okay, so that's what a quasi-species would look like at the nucleotide sequence level. So what are the, the effects of this? So you know what this is now. You understand what a quasi-species is. It arises from error-prone nucleic acid copying. So when you grow up a virus in a cell, you're growing up thousands and thousands and thousands of different individual virus mutants. What does it mean? Well, when you take a stock of virus and you infect the cell, you're not infecting with one sequence. You're, you're infecting with thousands of different sequences. When you get infected with influenza virus, if you get 10,000 influenza viruses going into your nose, you may have 10,000 10, different sequences initiating infection. And those different virus sequences that you are getting are the product of selection in the cell that produce them. Every time these, this population affects, infects a cell, there will be selection going on. Some of the sequences will lose, some of them will win, and there'll be a different quasi-species when we reach the next cell. So that's what I mean here, that the large number of progeny are complex products of selective forces inside the host, and then uh, the ones that reinfect the host are also selected by uh, forces in the environment. If, for example, the viruses are transmitted by aerosol routes. Now, in the laboratory, we tend to work with small numbers of viruses when we infect our cells. And th when that happens, when, that, when you do that, you can get very extreme fluctuations in uh, the sequence and in the, in the phenotype of these viruses. And we'll talk about why that is in a moment. So in the lab, sequence diversity is typically varied unless you do things to make it not so. So this is a slide of the first um, 900 bases of the poliovirus genome. So back in 19, uh, 1980, I think, I sequenced the genome of poliovirus. So this was the fir one of the first animal virus genomes to be sequenced. So I did this, this chemical sequencing, and I ended up with a, a sequence that I put on a computer, and it's 7,440 bases in length. This is the first 900 or so bases. This is a myth, right? This doesn't exist. What I got was the average of all the species 
So even back in 1980, I didn't really appreciate that. I was taking a, a virus stock, you know, billions and billions of particles, extracting RNA and sequencing it. And this is what I got. And this is the average. It doesn't tell you the diversity in a population. All right. Only today do we have the technology, and it's not quite there yet, to sequence this at a level where we could see individual molecules and know how many different sequences there are in the population. Yeah. Um, when you say average, do you mean you just get a stronger signal of a gel from one particular nucleotide or like juicy the interesting? Yeah, what I mean by an average is you will not see if a mutation at this position it only exists once in the stock, you'll never see it. Right. It has to comprise about 10 to 15 percent of the population. So what you're <coughs> seeing is the majority at each position and it's an average. All right, because no virus exists with that average sequence in the stock. It's very much like the one previously. This is the average of the stock, and there probably isn't a single virus that has that. Did you do Sanger sequencing? Yeah, so basically similar to Sanger, it's, it was a chemical sequencing called Maxim and Gilbert. So it's the same idea. You sequence the entire population. Today you can do what's called deep sequencing, and you can learn at a deeper level what the individual <coughs> changes are, but it's not quite there yet for a variety of reasons. So uh, for any virus sequence, you have to realize it's an average, uh, but every genome can be different from each other. So if I show you a sequence and I say, is this the sequence of the virus population? You have to say no, it's, this, it's the average sequence. So it's unlikely that that actually exists in the population. So I didn't know that back in 1980 when I did that sequence. I thought this was the sequence of poliovirus. If you go into GenBank and you can search for any virus and you can find the sequence of it, that is an average. Uh, okay, and that's important because when you do experiments and you change that average, you don't know really how the effects are uh, playing out in a population where there's so many different sequences. So it's a very difficult, kind of a difficult concept to get your head around, but just think that there is no single sequence in any virus stock. But yes? Are there certain sequences that we really care about? Those related to the receptor, those related to replication, those related to cytopathic There are sequences that we care about, sure. So if we change a particular amino acid, we can make the virus resistant to a drug. We know that. But we have no idea when we change that amino acid, well, what all the surrounding amino acids look like and how they're interacting with that. So we know that we can get very specific effects when we make certain changes. But what we don't know is how they're interacting with every other change and if that matters or not. Right. So yes, you can make conclusions about amino acids that are important for various properties. But what you don't know is the contribution of other sequences to whatever phenotype you're looking at. So this idea, this quasi, yes? So based on that, like the sequence is an average, how do you define the wild type sequence of a virus? Okay, so the, the question is, if the sequence is an average, how do you define wild type? So we define it as something that we have, we take a stock of poliovirus type 1, mm -hmm. isolated from uh, a patient, we call it wild type, we sequence it, we get an average and then we say this is the sequence of uh, wild type polio, understanding that it's an average. But there may be differences in the population that we don't see in this sequence that are very important. So you can't study it at this point basically, right? It's really hard but you have to, you have to, do, you have to work with what you have of course. But I just want you to understand that there's a lot we can't investigate because of this issue. So the quasi-species leads to a couple of facts about evolution. First, survival of the fittest in that mixture, in the quasi-species. And, and again, what I mean is that mixture of virus sequences. There may be one rare virus that survives a particular selection. And that, that mutation in that rare virus will then be found in all subsequent progeny. So let's say a virus is transmitting from person to person and a particular change is selected for in a very rare variant that will then be amplified and persist in the next population. So that's what we mean by survival of the fittest. You select a rare genome. At the same time, there may be unlinked mutations that go along as well, which are not selected for. Obviously, you can't select for every nucleotide in the genome. 
right? If there are 7,000 or 10,000 bases, you're only going to be selecting for a minority of them. There are other ones we say go along for the ride, sur survival of the survivors. The, these are unlinked but unselected. Linked because they're in the same genome, but unselected because they were not selected for and whatever uh, caused that original mutation to be present. So every time you apply selection, and that means every time a virus is multiplying or transmitting, sitting on a table somewhere, there's selection being applied. You get a diverse population at the end um, with selected mutations and whatever others came along with it. Okay. But you have to remember that at every step of replication, even within a cell, from the plasma membrane to the nucleus, even in that short distance, there's selection going on. And you draw from this large population of viruses uh, in order to select the ones that do that best. Interestingly, so selection pulls out of a population particular mutations that are important for whatever the selective force is. So again, uh, if you put a stock of viruses on a table and they dry out, and then maybe two hours later you, you recover the viruses and grow up what's left, you're selecting for mutations that enhance stability under drying conditions. So this is an extreme example just to illustrate it better for you. Um, so you're selecting for, say, a capsid mutation that confers stability to the virus particle, but you're also selecting for diversity because among the viruses with the right mutation, you have others with all kinds of mutations as well that go along, they're unselected, but that's important as well for diversity. And this is kind of counterintuitive. The drive for survival must result in diverse populations as well as selected mutations because if you didn't have a diverse population the virus would be gone after a few cycles. But we'll see how that, how that plays out in a moment. So even though you're selecting individual properties, the, all the diversity that goes along with it, the non-selected mutations are very important because in the next cycle or in the next ten cycles they're probably going to be important as well for some other aspect of selection. Here's an example of this kind of selection. So I've been giving you kind of um, clear-cut examples that uh, certainly exist, but this is an actual biological selection. This is an, an example of survival in a host. So at the end of AIDS, uh, after the 10 years or so, and the host has lost all uh, of the immune system and opportunistic infections are occurring, uh, you're producing a large number of virions, these tend to be T-cell tropic. That is, the co-receptor they prefer is CXCR4. Remember, HIV can use one of two co-receptors, CCR5 or R4. Typically, at the end stage of age, most of the viruses are engaging CXCR4. When you infect someone else, uh, the virus that replicate in the person you infect are not T-cell tropic they are M-tropic. They use a different co-receptor. So obviously this individual has passed along a minority population of viruses that can recognize CCR5 and those are the ones that predominate. So out of all the many viruses that are T-cell tropic that you pass on, it's the M-cell tropic minority that uh, replicate initially and populate the host within the first few weeks. And so we call this a bottleneck. It's a bottleneck because we've gotten rid of most of the population, most of the T-cell tropic population, and we've selected for the M-cell tropic. And then eventually, during the course of AIDS from this person again, that, will, that population will skew towards T-cell tropic uh, after the incubation period. So interestingly, the, one, the viruses that are destroying your immune system are not the most fit for initially transmitting and replicating in you. So it's a nice example of the kind of selective forces and how they change in the course of an infection. And this is a long-term change. And as I say, every minute in an infection, there are selective forces uh, at play. We don't always see them. This is one that's obvious to be able to see. All right, so let's get back to the, the point about diversity being important. Diversity itself is actually selected for. I've already given you an example where I said unselected mutations are important uh, during selection as well. They have to be brought along to allow diversity for the next selection event. So here's an experiment that illustrates that. Um, mutation is good for viral population. 
it's possible to have to identify mutations in polymerases, viral polymerases as well as cellular, that reduce the mistakes that they make. So these are called anti-mutator mutations. And these have been studied in a variety of, of systems. And what you find is very interesting. These mutations that make fewer errors do not have selective advantages when you do competition experiments. So there's a very nice um, experiment that was done with poliovirus. It's described in this blog post where they took a virus with a single amino acid change in the viral polymerase. This polymerase makes less errors than the wild type virus. And when you co-infect cells or animals with that mutant and wild type virus, the mutant loses always never predominates in the infection. It's always the wild type virus that wins. Even though the wild type virus makes more mistake, it doesn't win. So these mutants are typically less pathogenic and they lose out in competition experiments. So the conclusion is high mutation rates are a positive force. We're actually selecting for polymerases that make errors. Of course, there's a balance. You don't want to make too many errors. Otherwise, you mutate yourself into extinction. But on the other hand, if you made no errors, you would never evolve, and you would reach a dead end. You wouldn't exist as a species anymore. So there's a positive selection for polymerases that make errors. This is really important. Okay, so the idea that you don't want to make too many errors, you don't want to make zero errors, you don't want to make too many, you want to make something in between, this is called the error threshold. All right, so our viruses make a lot of mutants. This is a big advantage so that they can be selected and adapted to different environments in different situations. But as I've said, that has to be balanced. And the limit of mutation that a virus can sustain is called the error threshold. If you make more errors than the error threshold, you don't replicate anymore. You've mutated. You've got too many mutations in your genome and you're no longer infectious. And if you're too far below the threshold, as I said, you don't make enough mutations to, the, to survive all the selection events that a virus would encounter every replicative cycle. So just remember, every cycle, infect, replicate, produce, there's always selective forces. It's not just over the 10-year period of AIDS, but it's every replication cycle. Now, what we have found is that RNA viruses appear to evolve very close to the error threshold, very close to it. And DNA viruses are far below it. Now, here's some experimental data that has led to that conclusion. You take a DNA virus and uh, you expose cells to a base analog like 5-Aza cytidine. So this is a base analog that will cause mutations during DNA polymerization. So you infect cells with this DNA virus, you've got 5-Aza C. What happens is this is incorporated as a C but it templates, at, templates as a T. So when the polymerase passes over the incorporated 5 A's of C, the polymerase thinks it's a T, so the polymerase puts in an A instead of a G. So you have a G to A transition as a result. So it's a mutagen. Okay. What, you, what you find is that when you add this drug to vir DNA virus infected cell cultures, you increase um, the mutation rate several orders of magnitude, you know, 100, 1,000 fold. So you, you, apparently the DNA viruses are not making a lot of mistakes because you can increase the error rate uh, many fold by adding this mutagen. Now if you do this with an RNA virus, you add a mutagen to an infected cell, the error frequency only increases two to three fold. Now you can do this kind of experiment by sequencing the genomes. You grow up the viruses in the presence of the mutagen, either the DNA or the RNA virus, and you simply take the offspring and you sequence them. You sequence hundreds and hundreds of isolates. So the RNA virus hardly goes up in, in the number of errors that are incorporated. So this is one of the bits of evidence that they are existing at their error threshold. Because if you go higher than two or three fold, there's no more virus infectivity. Right, so DNA viruses are well below the error threshold. RNA viruses are at or near it. And this allows them to evolve more effectively than DNA viruses. So here is a, the data for this RNA virus experiment. So here, uh, what has been done is to uh, 
treat a virus infected cell, an RNA virus infected cell, this happens to be polio virus, with increasing concentrations of a mutagen, of a drug that causes mutations uh, in the RNA genome. Uh, so along here, increasing amounts of drug, and then uh, you can sequence the viruses that result and figure out the number of mutations per RNA genome that you've caused by incubating with the drug. And then you measure the infectivity of the RNA here. You can see that uh, with no mutagen, you have 100% infectivity, you set it at 100% there. And then as you increase the amount of mutagen, you have a sharp decrease in the amount of infectivity with just a couple of extra mutations per genome. Two to four extra mutations per genome, you lose almost 100% of the infectivity. Okay, so in other words, you can't mutate the genome any more than it already has been mutated. If you go up to 16 changes per genome, you don't get any infectivity. So you can, you can do this experiment by sequencing the genomes that result, but they're not infectious, as you can see from here. So poliovirus and many other RNA viruses are at their uh, error threshold. And in fact, that's being exploited uh, as an antiviral. There are some... Um, antivirals that actually push RNA viruses over the error threshold as a way of uh, getting rid of them. So, you know, last time we talked about a lot of strategies for antiviral inhibition, polymerase inhibitors, receptors, but this is a different one. This pushes uh, the viruses over the error threshold. It makes mutations in the genome. Now, an interesting aside, uh, the drug used for this experiment is called ribavirin. And it's a mutator, as you can see. You can select viruses that are resistant to this drug. You can select polioviruses that are resistant to this drug. So they are not inactivated by increasing concentrations. Where do you think the mutation that confers that phenotype is in the viral genome? Any idea? So we select viruses resistant to this mutator drug. The mutator drug is pushing so the mutator is making mutations in the genome and pushing it over its error threshold. It's inactivating infectivity. We can now select for viruses that are resistant to the drug. And you can add tons of drug and the viruses replicate quite nicely. So the question is, where is the mutation in the virus that confers this resistance to this drug? So what would be the protein involved? in that. Now, RNA viruses don't have proofreading, right? But you're close. You're close. What's just before proofreading? Yes. Did you? Yeah, exactly. So that mutation is in the polymerase. And in fact, that mutation makes the polymerase less error prone. All right? So that's how we found out for polio that making fewer errors is not, is not a good thing. This is the slide I showed you a couple of slides ago. That anti-mutator poliovirus was made by selection in the presence of this drug. So the reason why the virus is resistant to the drug is because the mutation makes, allows the polymerase to make fewer mutations, so the drug can't push it over the error threshold. It's kind of a neat, neat correlation there. All right, so we've mentioned once this idea of a genetic bottleneck, and particularly going from early to late stage AIDS and then infecting someone else is a bottleneck that results in a change of the kinds of viruses that are transmitted. So let's talk a, a little more detail. What is a genetic bottleneck? These are very extreme selection pressures uh, that uh, result in loss of diversity uh, and accumulation of mutations that you don't actually select for. And so one way to do this or to demonstrate a bottleneck is you take an RNA virus and you do a plaque assay, so you get plaques under agar. You pick a single plaque. Now a single plaque doesn't have many viruses in it. It only has about a few thousand or maybe 10,000 at the most, so it's a very restricted population. You then take that virus from the plaque and you plaque it directly on another monolayer. So you make dilutions of it, you plaque it so you get individual plaques. You pick that, Again, you, you plaque it out again. You pick another plaque, you pack it out again. Okay, so you do this over and over. You go plaque to plaque. So you're taking a small population, a, a very restricted population in terms of genetic diversity, and going from selective situation to selective situation. So when you do this, what happens is you introduce a bottleneck. 
And that's because you, are, you have a very small population that you are passing. A few thousand or 10,000 progeny viruses derived from one initial virus. Remember, each virus, each plaque is formed by one virus particle. So you have one particle. Now, one sequence. Now, this is really just one virus. It's going to give rise to 10,000, say, different viruses, which is very limited diversity. And then you're going to pass that again. You're applying a bottleneck because you have restricted uh, viral diversity. So here is the, the picture illustration. You have a parent population. Uh, you put the viruses through a bottleneck, so a reduction in population. Uh, the survivors then, when you grow up, have a different uh, distribution in terms of their genomes from the original population because you've restricted the number that can go through. So that's a genetic bottleneck. So what you find is in this experiment that we're doing, after you do about 20 to 30 plaque to plaque passages, uh, you get very, very sick virus populations and they're barely able to grow. They're very less fit than the original population. And why is this? Because the environment has been the same, right? You just have a cell which isn't changing. You're using the same cells every time. You're using the same auger, the same temperature, it's the same lab, even the same person doing the experiment. So the selection isn't changing. Yet, by the end of this 20 or 30 passages, the viruses are, are unable to replicate. Why is it? Why does this happen? The answer is in this, uh, well, it's a genetic bottleneck, and it's explained by a phenomenon called Muller's ratchet, which says that small asexual populations, like a virus, uh, decline in fitness over time if the mutation rate is high. So as you know, RNA viruses make a lot of mutations. They replicate asexually. And what happens is we are restricting the diversity of the population by just picking one plaque, which only has 10,000 particles in it. So as a consequence, many mutations end up uh, accumulating that you would not normally have, but you're pulling them along because otherwise you wouldn't be able to get any placking at all. So you have a very limited population, you accumulate mutations that aren't selected for, and that's why the fitness declines. So the, the name Muller's ratchet is, is the, comes from this metaphor, a rat, this is a ratchet. Uh, each mutation works like a ratchet. So a ratchet, in a ratchet, the gear can move forward, but it can't go back because it's got this blocker preventing the gear from going back. So every round of replication is working like a ratchet. It keeps adding mutations and clicking forward, and the virus can't go back and get rid of those mutations because the population is so limited when you go from plaque to plaque. And that's a nice illustration of why you need diversity. To get rid of all these bad mutations, you need genetic diversity, and we are taking that away by doing this uh, plaque to plaque passage. So here's an illustration of what we have just done. Here is our initial population of viruses. It's a quasi-species, right, where, it, where every member is different. And then uh, if we just took this population and infected a cell monolayer, didn't do a plaque assay, just infected under liquid and let all the viruses replicate, you would basically uh, select for mutations that are compatible with replication in those cells. Uh, and then you would end up with a, a similar distribution of uh, mutations. But if you do a plaque purification, you're now enriching for a single genome. Remember, a plaque is initiated by one virus. So now we pick this one genome, say, out of the whole population. And who knows if these mutations are particularly good for future, future placking and growth. So now all the viruses that grow out of that are going to be biased. Many of them are going to have these original three mutations here. Uh, and if you keep repeating this process, you keep placking out, you're eventually going to accumulate a lot of non-selected mutations and decrease the fitness. And you don't have a big pool of mutations to rescue uh, all of these bad mutations. So that's what's happening in a bottleneck. And here's an actual experiment to show you that this does happen in the laboratory. These are the amount of uh, fitness decline, uh, it's the uh, percent of loss of infectivity, uh, compared to an initial virus stock after passage through a bottleneck. And here the bottleneck is plaque to plaque passage. So we have a bacteriophage, 40 passages, 22% decrease in fitness. Uh, foot and mouth disease virus after 30 passage, 60% decrease. HIV, 94% decrease after just 15 passages. 
And again, this is because you're restricting diversity to population. You are biasing the population towards mutations that are present in that plaque that you pick. So you're artificially selecting mutations. You're not letting the mutations be randomly selected uh, during a population growth. So does this happen in the real world? Right? This happens in a lab, but who cares if it doesn't happen in the real world? Well, it does. And there are many examples where uh, infections are initiated by small numbers of virus particles, like you would uh, find when going from plaque to plaque. So small droplets that you would inhale to get a virus infection, those droplets may only have a few thousand virus particles in them. And then when that virus replicates in you, the limited genomes are going to be amplified. You're going to then transmit them to someone else by small droplets, so you're going to inoculate them with a limited population. So you can see that a person-to-person -person serial spread of an infection could be a bottleneck, limiting uh, diversity. L activation of latent viruses from limited populations and then spread to another person. Uh, insect bites may introduce small numbers of viruses. So there are plenty of opportunities for this kind of bottleneck to happen in nature. So why do virus infections go on then? Why don't they all go away because of Muller's ratchet? Well, because they get rescued, basically. They avoid the ratchet. Now, in the lab, you could avoid the ratchet in your experiments um, by not just picking a single plaque, but pooling many plaques and then using those to infect new cells. And what you're doing is you're giving more diversity to this second infection. You're not just taking these small numbers of viruses in one plaque. You're mixing them. You get more and more diversity, and that avoids the ratchet. Okay? And we have seen this in our lab when we have tried passaging viruses. Uh, the, I remember years ago, a student of mine, after 20 or 30 passages of a virus in a mouse cell, she was trying to adapt a virus to a mouse cell. She said, my titers are going way down. I said, mix a few plaques together because she was encountering Muller's ratchet, and that solved the problem. Can you just slow down the uh, mutation rate? Slow down the mutation rate. So the question is, can you slow down the mutation rate as a way to avoid the ratchet? What do you think? Why not? You slow the ratchet down, you won't stop it. Well, the problem with the ratchet is that um, you, have low, you have less diversity to rescue the, the restricted population. So it would probably be even worse if you, if you slow down the mutation rate in but the long it, run. But is it because you have a small population and a high mutation rate that you've got the right thing? Yeah, the high mutation rate contributes, sure. So you might slow it down. Maybe it would take 40 passages instead of 20. But uh, it would still occur because you're restricting the diversity um, by the plaque-to-plaque -plaque passage. So in nature, um, how do we get around this? We don't, <laughs> we don't get five people to infect another person, right? Well, together. So there's another way. And the ray is that viruses recombine or reassort. So the viruses that are present in that um, inoculum can recombine or reassort with one another to make genomes that are fit for the next round of selection. So that removes mutations that affect uh, growth in a negative way. And so even if in a droplet of, of aerosol with 10,000 viruses coming into you, there may be two viruses that are fit in that. And if they recombine and give rise to one good virus, that will take over the population. Such are the selection forces. One rare event can dominate the, what grows out. Okay, so the progeny of this kind of recombination that rescues the mutations uh, imp imposed by the ratchet will take over the population. So this is another example of how diversity is important for the population. When you restrict the diversity, which is what we have done in a plaque-to-plaque -plaque passage, a bottleneck, we've reduced uh, fitness. And remember, when we reduce diversity by making a mutation in the polymerase that reduces error rate, we also uh, reduce fitness as well. So two compelling reasons to show you why uh, diversity is important uh, for evolution. So here is just an illustration of what I mean by rescuing the mutant viruses by recombination. So in a droplet of, vir of um, virus-laden aerosol that you've inhaled, there are very few viruses. Most of them uh, have debilitating mutations. But here's one sick virus with a mutation here. 
and another one with here. If recombination occurs between these two, you can get a healthy recombinant. And this need only happen once, and it can, this healthy recombinant can then take over the population. So this is one reason why the ratchet doesn't apply in real life situations. So exchange of genetic information is what we're talking about. Reassortment or recombination allows the construction of viable genomes. Um, and reassortment is what it's called, remember, when the viruses have segmented genomes. So influenza viruses, which has eight segments, these don't actually have to recombine. You can shuffle segments. If you have one segment that has a debilitating mutation in it, it can be substituted by reassortment. And this kind of exchange of information is important for variation and evolution of flu viruses, orthomyxoviruses, and rheoviruses, the rotaviruses that cause gastroenteritis. They both have segmented genomes, and th their ability to reassort plays a big role in their ability to spread through populations. So let's talk about this a little bit specifically in terms of influenza virus. So influenza is a great example. It has high variability, and it uses reassortment to escape the ratchet. And we're going to talk about the kinds of selection pressures that are applied to influenza viruses. As you know from uh, what we've discussed before, whenever a virus infects an organism and antibodies or immune cells, cytotoxic T cells are, are elaborated, um, you can always select for viruses that are resistant, right? Because if an antibody is binding to a specific epitope on the capsid to neutralize the virus, there will be in the population at least one virus particle that can escape that neutralization, just inevitably. Same thing with a T-cell epitope that's the target for T-cell lysis. So inf influenza does this all the time. And there are two mechanisms that I think you've heard of from Dr. Silverstein before. There's antigenic drift. So this is diversity, again, arising from mutation errors that lead to amino acid changes in the viral glycoproteins. Every time the genome replicates, there are more mistakes made. And if they are carried on to progeny uh, viruses, if they are viable, they may allow escape from antibody. So let's say you're, you're immunized against flu uh, one season, and you're infected with a virus that matches that vaccine quite well. As the virus is replicating in you, which it will do initially before the vaccine-generated antibodies kick in, you'll have a virus made that evades the antibodies that are going to neutralize all the other particles. And that single virus may replicate in you quite well. You may get flu even though you were immunized, and then you will say, I'm never getting a flu shot again because I get flu anyway. But that virus selected in you will go on and infect many other people. And then the next season, that will make it necessary to change the vaccine against influenza. So starting from a rare variant in one person, we have to change the vaccine. And that's what's called antigenic drift. There's another more serious kind of variation that occurs in influenza virus called antigenic shift. And this is the kind of diversity resulting in reassortment of segments. So these are major changes in antigenic makeup. And this in results in viruses to which nobody is immune. And these cause pandemics every 20 or 30 years, global epidemics. So let's talk a little bit about that because we had a recent pandemic in 29. Influenza viruses, as you know, um, are classified by the glycoproteins in the virus particles, the HA and the NA. There are quite a few HAs in NA. They're, uh, they're actually more than, we're up to 17 HAs and nine neuraminidases. And the various combinations are called H1N1, H3N2, et cetera, H5N1. And we have three hemagglutinins that can infect humans. H1, H2, and N3. H5, we're not sure about. Uh, but the rest can infect birds. Birds can be infected with every strain of influenza virus that we know about. All right, so each of these HA is encoded on an RNA segment that can shuffle around and get reassorted into all uh, different progeny viruses. Now, over the years, every so many years, a new pandemic influenza strain has emerged as a consequence of reassortment between human and animal strains. All right, so let's start in 1918. So in 1918, you recall, there was a huge lethal pandemic. Many millions of people died. This is believed to be a virus that originated in birds and infected 
people directly. So that's called the 1918 Spanish influenza. So here we have the bird influenza virus infecting people. All the segments are red. And this virus, after that initial pandemic, every year it caused an epidemic of, of much less magnitude. But uh, in, in the early years, of course, there were no vaccines. We started immunizing against uh, flu in the 1940s. And we noticed that the vaccine wasn't good for more than a few years. And that's because the virus is changing every year. So if slightly evading immunity, it's drifting uh, and causing outbreaks every year. Now, in 1957, a brand new strain emerged, H2N2, and it caused a pandemic because no one was immune to it. You see, it has two brand new surface glycoproteins, the hemagglutinin and the neuraminidase. Where did they come from? They came from an H2N2 avian virus. So somewhere, some animal was infected with both an H1N1 and an avian H2N2. It could have been a bird, it could have been a pig or something else. The right reassortant emerged, which could then replicate in people, transmit among people, and evade immunity. No one had immunity to H2N2, and so it caused the pandemic. Okay, so you see the pattern here. These, just think in birds or in other animals that are infected by influenza viruses, you can have multiple co-infections, you can have reassortment, and the fittest virus for infecting people will take off. Now the assumption is, of course, that we have contact with an whatever animals are producing these reassortants. And that goes without saying. Uh, we have lots of contact with pigs through agriculture uh, and plenty of opportunities for birds as well. The next uh, pandemic was 1968. You can see this virus was H3N2. So it had the neuraminidase from the 1957 strain, but it picked up an H3NA, again, probably from a bird virus, and a bunch of other segments as well uh, from this bird virus. So brand new hemagglutin, and nobody was immune to it, caused another pandemic. 1977, uh, the 1957 virus was actually accidentally released from a lab somewhere and this caused a pandemic because nobody had antibodies against H1N1. This is kind of a side story. It's not natural biology. It's, it's, we, we think that someone was doing a vaccine trial somewhere with this and it got out. And that's where we stood up until 29, 2009. In 2009, a new pandemic strain emerged H1N1, swine origin H1N1. And this virus was produced by multiple reassorting between a, um, a Eurasian pig virus. These are pigs that are raised in Europe and Asia, and they have certain viruses that circulate in them, by a classical swine virus. So in 1918, when that H1N1 virus went from birds to people, it also went into pigs at the same time. And that virus has been infecting pig populations since then. That's called the classical swine virus. And pigs um, don't mount much of an immune response against influenza virus. They don't have a chance. They're slaughtered after six months. So the possibility of a virus remaining for long periods in them without varying much exists. Uh, and then a human H3N2 virus. Remember, these had been circulating since 1968. And an avian virus of some kind. And, and all of this was uh, determined by sequencing the genome of this virus. And we could tell that uh, it was the product of reassortment of many different viruses. So this happened in some animal. We don't know where. The first cases were observed in Mexico and in California and Texas. So it, it's possible it arose on a pig farm in Mexico. But which animal was co-infected with all these viruses, we don't know. We probably will never uh, be able to prove that. But the point is, if it happened in a pig, so the virus arose in a pig, then whoever was working with the pig got infected. It replicated well in that person because selection pressures were put under play to pull out just the right virus. And then that spread to the rest of the population. So that's an example of how Reassortant can give rise to variation, which is then used as the basis for, for evolution. Now, when you have antigenic drift in the influenza virus, what is happening from year to year is you have mutations at the tip of the hemagglutinin molecule. So here's the flu virus particle. Remember, the major glycoprotein is the HA. Uh, this is what is used to attach to cells. When you make antibodies that block infectivity, 
Ma most of those antibodies are directed against the tip of the molecule, which is where the uh, receptor binding site is located. So over the time, you get single amino acid changes up here, and they make the antibodies less effective at, effective at binding, and consequently, they don't neutralize as well. So every time this area changes sufficiently, we change the vaccine every few years. So far, from 2009, 2009 we have not yet changed uh, the flu vaccine. The strain has been exactly the same. It has not drifted sufficiently such that we have to change it. Now, very recently, people have found that amino acids in the stem region, so that region right there, these are very conserved. And you can induce very broadly reactive neutralizing antibodies by immunizing with these highly conserved sequences. And some people think that you could make a universal influenza vaccine that would protect against all strains. You would have to get it just once in your life. The reason is that these residues are, cannot change. If you put mutations in the stem, you will, you will knock out the infectivity of the virus. So they're not subject to the kind of variation that these residues at the top here are. So it could be that in the next 20 or 30 years, we have such a vaccine that will protect against uh, all possible strains of flu. Another example of uh, virus evolution by uh, recombination, there is a, um, uh, a, a virus called the circovirus, which is a small DNA virus, infects vertebrates. Uh, and there's another similar virus with, which infects plants, which is called a nanovirus. If you sequence the genomes of these viruses, you find that they're rep genes, that is, there's a gene encoding a protein needed for DNA synthesis, are hybrids. They both look very similar. They seem to be hybrids of, of two different viruses. These genes also have homology with a RNA binding protein of a RNA virus called Calissi viruses. The idea here is that nanoviruses were originally and still are plant viruses. Some animal at some point was eating sap and picked up this nanovirus from the sap. Within that population of nanoviruses, one was able to replicate in the animal and probably uh, to recombine uh, and become a circovirus. So the, then the, the Calissi virus, which is an animal virus, recombined with um, that virus as well. And now we have the present day circoviruses. So the idea is that circoviruses evolved from nanoviruses by recombination. So just another example of how this switching among genome sequences can give rise to material for selection. One final example, uh, there are viruses that infect cows called uh, bovine viral diarrhea virus. You can imagine the disease that this cause causes in cows. Uh, these are typically not serious viruses as shown here. Their genomes are RNA uh, and they're, they're, they encode a polyprotein. Sometimes these viruses, when they infect cells, pick up cellular sequences. So they recombine with cellular mRNAs. I'm showing you this just to show that viruses don't have to just recombine with one another. They can recombine with cellular mRNAs. And these two viruses here have picked up a cellular sequence uh, encoding ubiquitin. Ubiquitin is a, uh, a sequence that targets proteins for proteolytic degradation. And this picking up of this sequence allows these viruses to be cleaved, their proteins to be cleaved in unusual places and to make novel proteins that aren't made in the parent. And it turns out that these two viruses are much more virulent in cattle. The parent virus can cause persistent infections with not a lot of harm to the cattle, but the two viruses that have picked up cellular sequences are now much more virulent. So another example of recombination leading to evolution, but this time we're picking up a cellular sequence. Now when we talk about selection, and a question that always comes up, which I want to just visit briefly with you, is selection for virulence, increased virulence, a positive or negative trait. So I've just told you of a story where picking up a sequence from the host cell made the virus more virulent. But is that good? Is it good for viruses to become more virulent? Uh, so what we figure is that uh, the best situation would be uh, for a virus to evolve to be most infectious, right, to transmit from person to person very efficiently, but not kill everyone. 
because you don't want to kill all of your hosts, right? But that's not what we see. We don't see evolution to no virulence. If that were true, you would see every virus being highly transmissible but never virulent. And we simply don't see that. As you know, there are plenty of virulent virus infections. Uh, there, are, there are latent infections that eventually kill the host. Um, and it also varies from one species to another. So what's virulent in one species may be avirulent in another. So there doesn't seem to be a consensus about this. Even though I personally am surprised, I would think that virulence would not be selected for. But you can imagine that there are some cases where increased virulence would help you transmit. So <clears throat> by increased virulence, I would say a virus that makes you cough more is more virulent. And of course, that could help you to transmit. So that sort of increased virulence might be selected for. But killing hosts, to me, doesn't seem like a positive selection because then you eliminate uh, all of your hosts. So let me illustrate this for you uh, with a real life situation that um, tries to use viruses to control animals. So this is an experiment in virus evolution. Uh, the European rabbit was brought to Australia in 1859 for hunting purposes. Okay, people wanted to hunt these rabbits. So they brought them there and they multiplied, um, but they multiplied too much and they're all over the place. And so the Australians were unhappy about this and they had to figure out a way to get rid of these European rabbits. So you can see them all here. So they had their own indigenous rabbits in Australia, but they were too clever to be hunted by the Australians. So they brought these European rabbits in to hunt them. <laughs> right. So what they did is they released a virus in, in the 1950s. It's a myxoma virus, a pox-like virus. And it was known that this virus would not um, hurt the viruses that are indigenous to Australia, but they would uh, kill European rabbits, uh, 90 to 90% fatality. So it would be spread among the rabbits by insect bites uh, and um, it would kill them off. So they released this virus into the population to kill them. Right, so what happened? The first year, uh, the virus killed 99.8% of the rabbits, but didn't kill all of them. So those 0.2%. This is another example of selection. Those were resistant to infection. The second year, the mortality was 25%. By the third year, uh, the re rate of killing was lower than the reproductive rate of rabbits. So rabbits multiply very quickly, as you know, as do viruses. So this was a race between the two of them, and uh, the, vir the, the, the rabbits won. Both rabbits and viruses make a lot of offspring. The, the virus evolved to kill fewer rabbits, and extend the life of the rabbit so the virus could survive the winter. So it was actually a two-pronged selection. The, vir the virus evolved to be less lethal because that was better for the virus, so it could survive from season to season. And the rabbits evolved also to become more resistant to infection. Those 0.2% of the rabbits that survived, they had some mutations in some gene that allowed them to survive, and those mutations were then propagated into all the subsequent uh, um, offspring. And so this is what you would predict for a, a, an evolving host uh, pathogen interaction. It might, when the virus first is introduced into the population, it may be quite virulent, but eventually both the virus and the host are going to evolve to do what is best for both. So you get what you select, but you don't get what you want, which is a paraphrase of a song, right? Uh, trying to get rid of rabbits with a virus was a bad idea because you don't know what kind of forces are going to be at work. You can't assume that the virus is going to keep killing the rabbits and the rabbits would be all susceptible. So what was learned in Australia, nothing, because now they're trying a different virus to do the same thing. They're using a Khaleesi virus and um, we'll see what happens there, but I would not predict that it's going to be successful. Uh, finally, let's say a few words about where viruses came from. Um, there, are, there are theories that viruses uh, came from parasites that have lost their genes, that they arose from cells by reductive evolution, where they may have co-evolved with cells. The problem is we don't have a fossil record for viruses, so we can't just look at very old ones. But now bioinformatics, sequencing of contemporary viruses, finding uh, viral genomes integrated into cellular genomes has helped us to tease out uh, what's going on. So let me give you a couple of theories about uh, how viruses arose and some more contemporary ideas. So you remember at the beginning of this course we talked about a theoretical RNA world where all cellular life was based on RNA. There was no DNA. So here are some different cellular uh, forms of life with RNA. 
And here, the idea is that they all had different kinds of translation mechanisms. And here, the one that ended up surviving is the one that has ribosome-based translation that we know about today. So these RNA-based cells survived, and maybe all these other uh, kinds of mechanisms survived as parasites of these uh, surviving cells, as you can see here. These eventually, these yellow and red ones, uh, these eventually lost their genomes, or most of their genome, and became viruses. So now we have RNA cells and RNA viruses that have evolved. Then the idea is that the RNA world changed the DNA for many different reasons. It could have been at the level of the RNA virus or the RNA cell. We're not sure uh, which one. Uh, and that led to uh, the formation of DNA-based life. So we have an RNA cell. It could be that a DNA virus evolved separately and infected these cells and then delivered a DNA nucleus to the cells. Or another theory is that uh, these RNA cells changed their, their uh, nucleic acid to DNA. And eventually, you have DNA-based life, which we have today, of course. And we think that there were three separate introductions of, of DNA into these RNA cells that gave rise to bacteria, eukaryotes, and archaea, the three kingdoms of life. So this is based on looking at all the sequences of contemporary uh, viruses, of course, and making assumptions about what was the last universal cellular ancestor. Now, there are some very big DNA virus genomes around. Uh, including the Mimi viruses, which we've talked about, 1.2 million base pairs. Um, originally, when they were identified, it looked like they had a lot of cellular genes which weren't present in many other viruses. And so people thought, well, these could have originated as a cell and then started to lose all of their genes and became a big virus. So may maybe what we're looking at here is a virus on the evolutionary path to becoming smaller. But the argument against this was that, well, it's just one. It may be an anomaly, so it doesn't mean much. So just uh, last year, a, a relative of Mimi virus was discovered off the coast of Chile. It's called megavirus. And it has very similar cellular genes as does Mimi virus. In addition, it has other genes that Mimi virus doesn't have. So this suggests that there were at least two lineages of these kinds of viruses, which may have originated from cells that are undergoing reductive evolution. They're, they're losing genes and becoming parasites. So these big DNA viruses tell us a lot about uh, the origin of viruses. If you go to a more contemporary time scale, uh, the herpes virals, herpes virus evolution can be calculated to have originated uh, 180 to 220 million years ago, which would place it you know, back in the dinosaur era. Um, smallpox virus probably arose from a virus that originally infected gerbils. Today on the planet, gerbil smallpox viruses are the most related to human smallpox virus that we know. So we think that uh, human smallpox might have been a zoonotic infection, a gerbil virus that jumped into people and then it was selected for the ability to transmit and infect populations. In similar ways, measles virus probably came from cows. Measles is highly related to rinderpest, which is a pathogen of cows. And we think when people started growing cows for farming purposes about uh, 5,000 years ago, um, the viruses started jumping from cows into people and established itself as uh, measles virus. And there are many examples of spread of virus infections early in, during the colonization of the New World, in addition to measles, smallpox, of course, as well. Now, despite everything we've talked about today, about evolution, the, the extent of mutation, when you, see, when you see a flu virus, it's always a flu virus. It never changed. There's always constraints. Um, there, there, we have master sequences that are always maintained. We have a capsid that's always the same. It's always a flu virus. A flu virus doesn't become a herpes virus, and herpes doesn't become polio. So viruses have to evolve within constraints. They have to evolve within the constraints of uh, the genome. DNA can't be RNA and vice versa nowadays, as far as we know. The replication strategy is constrained. The nature of the capsid is constrained. And all the selective forces that go on during host infection are constrained as well. Okay, that's why a flu virus remains a flu virus despite making millions and millions and millions of errors as it's replicating. There are always host constraints. So new viruses will arise from what we have. They will not evolve de novo anymore. We have all seven genome types, and every new virus is going to come from what we have. 
So what, can we predict what is going to come out? It turns out that uh, for many, many RNA viruses, over half of the nucleotides can be mutated without affecting viability. So let's do some math. For a 10 kilobase virus genome, there are over 4 to the 5,000 sequence permutations that define all possible mutants. So if you assume that every base can be mutated, that's the number of possible new viruses that you could make. And that number is huge because there are 4 to the 135 atoms in the visible universe. That's, that's pretty small, but 4 to the 5,000 is huge. So there are enormous numbers of mutants that can rise. <laughs> There's enormous numbers of viral mutants. So the, the conclusion is that we're always going to get new mutants and we can never predict what's going to happen because uh, mutagenesis is, is uh, mutation rates are probabilistic and these, these huge numbers of possible mutants are just mind-boggling. So predicting directions of evolution is meaningless. We can't do it. We can just say that it's going to continue to happen. And let me leave you with this uh, interesting tidbit. It took 8 million years for simian primates to change 2% of their genomes to become people. You've seen this t-shirt. You could buy it and wear it because we're 98% chimp by our DNA sequence. So it took 8 million years to differentiate ourselves by 2%. Contrast, polio can change 2% of its structure in five days as it passes through your gastrointestinal tract. Can you imagine what a virus could do with uh, 8 million years. So that's what we're up against. The changes are phenomenal and evolution is amazing in terms of viruses.